Jeff, how are you? I'm good, buddy. How are you? Well, I, actually, I never thought I'd see Jeff Booth in Bedford. Me neither. Not at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did see him at 4 a.m. Yeah. It was a late night. It was a late yeah. night. Well, welcome to Bedford. Thank you for coming all this way. Uh, it's a real honor to have you here for this, for tonight, and for the football. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. It's already fun. You're going to see us get the trophy. Yeah. Um, that will be a late night. So listen, look, we've made a bunch of shows before. And I have an observation about your book. And my observation is, is that it, of all the Bitcoin books, it takes people, I think, the longest to fully understand hmm. because I think you have to see what's playing out in society to really understand your thesis. And I think it's a bit like the Matrix. You observe the world. You see the world. You see the markets. You see what's happening. And you see it through the Jeff Booth lens, The Price of Tomorrow, Whereas I think people like me and Danny are still seeing it for what it is, for what we're being told. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I think you even said last night you spoke to Luke Woman and it clicked for him during a during a call. And and so we want to get back into the thesis. We want to go back to the start, uh, and we want to try and see the world how you see it. Okay. So you sure, you, you sure? Yeah. No. I <laughs> no. I do because I think I nearly got it last night, and I said to Danny, I think what it is is. You, you are fully pricing everything in Bitcoin and seeing everything under Bitcoin terms in a way that I think I am, but I'm not. Right. And I want to get to that point where I, I really understand what you're seeing. So let's go back. Can you outline your deflation thesis, the one you talk about in the book? So it, the, wherever you start here, right, it's, it, it's that starting point is really hard because we're measuring that, our existing system from the system. And so it's hard to start in an entirely new paradigm unconnected from that. So, so what I try to do is I say, what, what are the kind of the economic rules in, in life, right? What would, the, what would that look like? And, and one of those rules is prices fall to the marginal cost of production, right? If you start there and nobody has ever challenged me on that, what, some people say, well, not if you regulate an industry, right? Well, do, explain to, explain okay. to people what you mean by the marginal cost of production, because some people might not even understand that. Yeah, so the, let's good. Let's dig deeper, but but start with prices. Period! Exclamation mark. Prices fall to the marginal cost of production, right? Over a long enough time horizon, you can regulate an industry for to stop it, right? You can, and then that technology keeps moving, and it moves outside of your area that you've regulated to a different domain that hasn't regulated. And then that attacks the, the incumbent or the regulated uh, industry. But over a long enough time horizon, prices fall to the marginal cost of production. Um, what does that look like in real life and why? So now let's take the calculator app when it came on the first calculator app on, on the iPhone, you paid for it, right? Or, or, or they monetized it through advertising, but they were making money from it. Otherwise, no, no entrepreneur would have created the calculator app, right? So they were creating a business. And next entrepreneur, next, oh, I can create a better calculator app. And they price it down to be able to win the market. Next entrepreneur, more, 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 and better and better and better until there's no money left in calculator apps, right? And now if you go to the app store, you'll see 50 calculator apps competing for your attention. They're all free. And in, it's ludicrous if somebody said to you, two things. If somebody said, hey, I have a calculator app, it's going to cost $30 a month, you'd laugh them out of your house. Mm. It's, it would be ludicrous. On the other side, if somebody came to me as far as an, as, as an investor in the ecosystem and said, I have this great idea for a calculator app, I wouldn't take the call. So we can see it happening. We can see it happening all around us. And it's because what ends up happening is when there is money in the economic incentive, and a market that allows you to rewrite the rules to create more value for people, the market moves there no matter what, and it attacks those margins until they're free. Are there exceptions to the rule, for example, luxury products? So, so, so let's, again, I don't think over the long enough time horizon, there's any exceptions to that rule. The, the, now, today, if you're measuring, in a world where, where, where the measurement itself 
is all on manipulated money, then people want to matter so much. They want to look good to society so much that they'll pay almost anything to stand out from the crowd. Right. But over a long enough time, and that's in the existing system. So, so yes, will people with money pay more for cer certain things or more for value? What they're actually doing, no matter what that e economic calculation is, in their head, they're saying, this has value to me. I, th I, I guess I, I want to phrase that slightly differently. There's a, there's a luxury car, and a luxury car won't go to the marginal cost of production because it's you know, two, three hundred thousand pound car. But there will be other cars in the market which will hit that marginal. Is so, that what it, is that what we're saying? So so play this on a long enough time horizon, even yeah. on a, on a car or food. So what are the inputs for that? And if when once the, all of the inputs are essentially robotic, robotics and AI merging to be able to drive cost way down. Can that value keep climbing, right? Because if it kept climbing unnaturally, because you were make, is because it, it's climbing today, because you're making up more monetary units to make it climb, right? Abundance and money equals scarcity everywhere else. That's the paradigm we live in today. Um, then it'll keep rising in those terms. But what's actually happening and what's actually happening on Bitcoin, because it's outside of that system, is it, it's pricing it's actually not going up. It's staying stable. Um, and yes, it's going up in fiat terms, but it's a better, better way to look at it that everything in price forever will fall against Bitcoin. That's what I said to you this morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in that environment, you will still have companies compete and some are going to compete on price. But also, there are scenarios where people compete on service so they can maintain their own margins. And and, and now play that forward. Yeah. So all prices are falling. Yeah. And some people are offer are able to offer more value for free. What would happen to the people that are that are charging more more for their service? Well, I think it depends on how better the service is and who the people are buying from them. Exactly. Just like it does today. Yeah. So. Each person is making a decision that you can't see before the, again, we're measuring the world from this system and we're carrying our baggage from the one we live in into the new one. And it works exactly opposite. So, so how do you see the world? You obviously see the world that we're not living. Yeah. You can visualize it. What do you see in that I don't see? I, that's why I said prices fall to the marginal cost of production, hmm. right? So if you know that that's, that's going to happen over a long enough time horizon, and if you merge, if you said that productivity, so two things, prices fall the marginal cost of production, mm -hmm. the marginal cost of production everywhere is falling exponentially because of AI robotics, and it's going to fall faster and faster and faster. And what's happening, it's actually chicken and egg, what came first? The debt is a response and the manipulation of money is a response to that, that massive productivity gain that should be flowing to society in the form of lower prices being stolen and concentrated at the top through manipulation of money because it has to stop that deflation because if the deflation was allowed to happen all of the banks would fail all of the all of everything would fail your way of life would fail tomorrow and talk me through why they would fail because what what it, that deflation would mean and that's where people conflate the difference about deflation, that debt deflation, the, the, the debt in the world is uh, already insolvent. So the debt needs to inflate. Exactly. The debt is, so we live in a world, um, effectively a make-believe world, um, where, where that debt is already insolvent and we pretend it's solvent, right? Everybody, we pretend it's solvent. Do you and, mean the, the debt as a whole rather than individual debts? Because some debts... I'll pay, you know, aren't insolvent. So, so you live in a system where the entire system is insolvent. Yeah. And you're sp supposed to try to remain solvent. So you're playing by different rules yeah. than the system plays. And at the top of that system, if you're too big to fail, you get bailed out by the taxpayer over and over and over again. So what ends up happening is everybody races to try to be too big to fail. It creates the very incentive that, um, uh, to make essentially theft a base layer in the economy. And what would the mirror reflection of society look like if you had 
theft as a base layer of every trade, right? Because that's what it looks like. Mm. Who would win in that environment? And, and, and theft is a harsh word, right? And so people don't, oh, no, it's not theft. Well, tell me what it is. Like actually, so if it's not theft, you don't vote for it. You don't vote for inflation, uh -huh. right? You don't have, you don't have a, a say that more, more, more monetary units are created. And, and you, think, you think what's happening is, maybe a simple way to do it is this. Imagine, well, you don't have to imagine, there's eight billion people in the world. There, and let's say there's eight, eight, eight billion monetary units, right? And eight billion is not too hard for your mind to understand. Once you get to trillions, your brain just breaks. Right, and so 400 trillion is a lot of money, right? That it's just, your mind can't comprehend that. But 8 billion people, 8 billion monetary units. Of those monetary units in the world, you have two of them. I have one of them, Danny has half of one. If magically the next day there's 16 billion monetary units, did wealth go up in the world? Nope. Right, same, just a different measurement, abundance and money, create scarcity everywhere else. So what ends up happening is, but you think it did because you're, you're four, you're, you're two. If it didn't go to four, then you got your pocket picked. So if the distribution was equal, everything would be, remain the same. Exactly, but what ends up happening is, is the, the rich get more of that and that in, because the rich have more of the assets that don't move, right? More of the stocks that take that value and the poor, inflation is wage deflation. Yeah. Right. So the poor, if you don't have access to, to, uh, to, to all of the stocks, land, everything else, the things that are holding value better than others, they're all losing value, right? But they're whole, some are holding value better than others. Then, then you're, you're two going to four if it went to three you would think you were winning because you weren't, you weren't measuring this. And the yeah. person that it, 50 cents that went to 55 cents and got a, got a raise, right? Or, or, or half a monetary unit, they think they're getting a raise and they're getting their pocket picked like crazy because they're measuring that system from the system that's being manipulated. So the, there is an incentive therefore to hold debt, especially at the right interest rate. So, you know, this house I've bought, I've got a 2% mortgage in an environment where we're living with what we eleven percent inflation in the UK. Luke Woman said to me just this this week that he expects, which we'll get into, you know, high double digit inflation, perhaps even triple uh, di digit inflation. I'm actually a beneficiary of that yeah. scenario. Yeah, and if you had if, if you had twenty houses, you're more of a beneficiary. If you're Black BlackRock and you're using that, and 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 you can't lose because you know that you're too big to fail, then you can leave her up like crazy. And you can buy effectively everything and then rents go up. And, and, and again, it's picking the pocket of, of any, any working class, any productive member of society. It favors the rent seekers. And then we call those rent seekers the elite. And it's all based on theft. Okay, so the theft itself, for me, implies a a conscious act of yeah. theft. And so I really want to understand uh, who are the thieves, who are the, just the, I don't consider myself a, th a thief, but I'm benefiting from this. And so I've always tried to understand, is this an organic system of incentives or are there people actively involved in this who understand the benefits? So, so would some people understand the benefits and turn a blind eye? Absolutely. The majority, it's a system reinforcing and people telling themselves that they have to keep this going because if they don't keep it going, the world collapses. And actually, it does. It does. <laughs> yeah. And so you could easily tell yourself if you're Bernie Sanders or Liz Warren and your base is, is, is telling you how much they love you because you're attacking big interests big, um, and you're going to redistribute that. Their, their whole feedback mechanism, they will disconfirm evidence that we're, what we're talking about because their feedback me mechanism from their base that has hurt the worst tells them how great they are, right? And for them to unwind their belief system to face the truth means 
that a lot of the people that they say they're helping, they're hurting the most. And that would be a really hard thing to, that's actually why these things just feed back. It would have to tear down their entire belief system, rebuild it on something that actually helps their base. And that's too, it's, people don't want to hear that, right? It, it, it tears them down. It's too big a shift. It's too big a shift. It's just too hard to believe. And so, you, so it's easier just to say, I'm doing the best I can in the system, right? And, and be a cog in that wheel. And that, that whole system gets more and more unstable and other things start to happen. That's actually why if you like that greatest game article I wrote, wrote mm. was written in November of 2020. You could look at it right now and see exactly where we are in the system change, right? You could, you could see exactly what step-by-step step has to happen in the existing system. I talked about proxy wars coming. And, and, and what had to happen, I talked about CBDCs long before CBDCs or kind of people are talking about it. And that's just starting, right? I talked about what eventually the banks will be, why the banks will move to Bitcoin because they have to, right? Because otherwise their power is going to be taken away through the government. Because if you have a direct, direct distribution, then you can. Um, so all of these things, if you just look at that article, you can see exactly where we are in this transition from systems. And that's why I don't, give the existing system a lot of energy when all of these things that I know are going to happen and all the next things that I know are going to happen. Okay. It's just noise. It's booster numbers. <laughs> I now get ego death capital as well. That's the perfect name. For your <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I spoke to Luke and Luke said to me very casually that he sees hundred percent inflation coming. And we know that Argentina has just gone back over 100% inflation. Bitcoin has just hit an all-time high. I'm not sure if you saw Preston's incredible tweet, but it said, try and, uh, try and stop Argentinians seeing this. Yeah. But in my mind, I know the country I live in has had high inflation before. But when I see 100% inflation, I think of Lebanon, Turkey, Argentina. I do not think of the US or the UK or Europe. And Luke's explanation is that there's so much debt in the system, there is, there's only two answers. There's two forms of default. There's a hard default and a soft default. A hard default's unpalatable, so it has to be a soft default. It has to be through inflation. And he said, you could do multiple years of 10, 20% inflation. Well, that'd take a long time. And he said the best thing is a short, sharp shock, two, three years of 100% inflation, like Israel, and bring down the debt to GDP back to 50%, and then the party starts again. So, so he's right. on the, we, we talked about this probably on our first podcast, or certainly a yep. second, the exact same thing. There's two doors. Yep. Right? There's always been two doors. Hard default, $400 trillion of hard, hard default, and all of this monetary units, that in, in all the black pools of money, everything collapsing. That day would look like this. Three days later, you'd walk to your grocery store, which would be closed. You'd try to get food off the shelf, would be, be closed. It'd be complete chaos ever, everywhere. And if you look at countries that go through that, it looks dystopian, right? That's what it, that, so that would come immediately. And that's why, so let's- Okay, so it's just, it's not just unpalatable politically, it's also dangerous. It's dangerous and, and here's the thing, you wouldn't vote for it. We are so, we, we believe, like if you live in Twitter universe, right, or Bitcoin Twitter, you believe because a lot of people would say, how dare the Fed do that? How dare the government do that? Well, they at the same time would vote for more of it because if their way of life collapsed, right, they think what everyone else should do, yet not themselves as a, per, per, as a cog in that system and what that would look like. That would look like, you go back to the stone ages and you're bartering for everything. And Bitcoin would do really well in that environment because it would be the only thing that would kind of retain value. But there's a whole bunch of unintended consequences that would, it would be ugly. It'd be really ugly if that was, and, and you can see what that looks like for countries that don't have their currency, right? Don't have the reserve currency because it looks like that, right? And, and, and it looks like that. How do they get out of it now? 
why that has implications for Bitcoin and why this is going to take a long time to play out is if those people knew Venezuela, Lebanon, Turkey, then, then you would think that Bitcoin would have 100% penetration there. But it doesn't. It, doesn't, it probably doesn't have 5% penetration. Right? So why at 100% inflation do people not change? And that's a clue for you wouldn't change either. Or you would, I would. But most people, what, what Luke's talking about is they get the rug pull. And what would, what would that look like in Venezuela, say, for example? Comparatively to the rest of the world, they just got their, their currency devalued. And now businesses, given it, if it was a decent government infrastructure, now businesses go back and invest in there because they're it's cheaper cheap. than the wor yeah. world, right? So everybody that's just d got destroyed, wiped out, decides to play the game again, right? Because they think they're winning because now you have this economic advantage and it actually strengthens the U.S. dollar. Right. What ends up happening is the U.S. essentially is strip mining the world. Well, that's what we spoke about with Alex Gladstein, really. Yeah. It's, but, but, but that function yeah. and all of those people there think they're now, now they're winning. Now, then you now take that into the BRICS and what the BRICS are doing. If you, it, and, and do you believe, is it reasonable to believe that with China's debt to GDP, without the black pools of money, right? Without the, what's not known. You have kind of 350% debt to GDP, which is completely, it's, no country in the world has ever created more debt faster. So China's miracle, growth miracle, was a debt miracle that is coming due. 25% of their economy, about 25% was, was housing, which, which is coming due. It's not productive assets, it's store of value to be able to stop this and it's coming due. There's no way to grow out, grow to, grow out of that, especially when that growth, right? Remember prices fall to the product marginal growth should be making debt more expensive because growth is deflationary in our world. Does that make sense? Mm. Right? So when people talk about growth, what they, what they should be saying is prices should be falling faster because most of that growth is on rails that bring prices down. So, so what would a true measure of growth be? Because you can't just measure prices. You have to have consumption alongside those prices to know. So a true, true measure of growth is, is productivity. Productivity. How do you measure productivity? Is Pro that hours worked? Productivity is, is prices falling. It's so, uh, so, so, so you have a mismeasure of growth. And so if, as you take more things out of the GDP calculation, photos, calculator apps, all of these things, videos, Zoom, all of these things, as automation does that work and those jobs are replaced or by automation, then prices should fall. And, and that's net negative GDP. So then what makes up the difference in GDP? There's less things to be able to manipulate up in price. So the GDP figures that are quoted, I even heard it this morning, I'll come back to that, but the quotation or use of GDP figures is part of the gaslighting? Yeah, it's not part of the gaslighting. They actually believe it. Oh, they believe it. They believe it because this concept, what you started with, prices falling to the marginal cost of production. Effectively, my book could have had one line, technology is deflationary, <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> because if that's true, then an inflationary system must steal that productivity gain that should flow to society, and it must concentrate it up into some people's hands to be able to to uh, to uh, to make that work. So why have they been able to steal it from some parts of the economy, but things like you know, TVs, they just haven't been able to steal that? Why why is that the case? So so again, you're mis you're mismeasuring. You know yeah. that chart that when you say kind of what all the some some, some price, things some, gone up, some yeah, all things would start at zero and fall in price. Yeah. All things. Yeah. What you're seeing, some things falling in price and something is rising. It's relative. Is relative yeah. to, the, to the system. And so all of those things, so TVs would have fallen a lot faster. Computers would have fallen a lot faster. Phones would have fallen a lot faster. But houses would have fallen too. Because energy would have fallen too. There's been productivity gains in all of those industries, right? All of those industries would have seen falling prices. 
Right. So what really is happening is with the mass increase in debt is causing a, a redistribution of income unfairly to the haves. To the, to the haves. Against the haves not. Yeah. And when everything reprices, it will kind there will be, there'll be some proportionality to it, but the poorest will come out worse and the richest will survive it. From the existing system. Because the pie is still one size. Exactly. All we're doing is we're using debt to redistribute the pie unfairly. So exactly. The debt's already insolvent. So who are you going to let win? Who are you going to let uh, uh, lose? The debt's insolvent. And so if people have leveraged up that debt that's already insolvent and you make the money cheaper, they pay back the debt in cheaper terms. But if they lever at the wrong time and you have deflation, then they get wiped out too. Yeah. Right. So you're playing you're playing a really scary game at this and at this kind of end of days on a on a, it's not end of days on a financial system, but lots of events could happen to flip it one way. And, and if you don't have enough time in that, if you're all in on a system and that it doesn't go your way, you're wiped out. So you re really should have some debt, some credit. Well, well you, I think about it as a barbell strategy. Yeah. Right. What happens in the, so play the probabilities of different, different events, right? It, it, let's use, let's use uh, Balaji's bat. I believe Balaji's bat is a, essentially just a marketing ploy to be able to come back and be all in Bitcoin after, and kind of wash his hands of all the. Uh, He's Bitcoin washing, orange washing. I, I, th I think so. No, he might, he might actually now get it and, and he might. But these are the same things, like that bat is the same thing that Bitcoiners have been talking about for a long, long time. And the probability of him winning the bat is, to me, so infinitesimally small, I, I can't assign a zero probability. But what that actually means if he wins a bat is you had a nonlinear collapse of the exact entire financial system. Yeah. And what we already talked about is in some nations, as because it's going to happen in the US last, Right. In some nations, as, as, as their currencies break down, they make that system stronger. So I, I don't think he's right at all. And, and, and in those countries, if you measured what do those people do, they don't all move to Bitcoin. Right? They stay in the system. They get, they get killed. And well, then they, they believe... They go to the dollar first sometimes. So, so, so a friend of mine uh, who, who climbs mountains for, uh, for kind of hospitals and uh, kids with cancer, um, he was flying into McKinley. Um, and and as, he was, uh, as he's flying in, I think they had to land kind of an uphill ice slope or something like that. Uh, something like that. It might have been, it, I might be getting it wrong. It might have been in Nepal, but it, uh, but it was either McKinley. Scary either way. Yeah. Yeah. Scary either way. <laughs> they're flying in and he sees this plane rolled over and he's talking to the pilot and everything else as they're flying in. And he goes, and he says, I guess that airline's out of business. And the pilot goes, no, no, that's this airline. Um, and he goes, everyone died and everything else in this airline. And, and, the, and Russ looks at him and, he, and, and the guy goes, huh, people forget. <laughs> and, uh. and, but, but again, what you're talking about, yeah. Argentina, or it, it, all, the system has so much power over them and they're measuring the system by the system and they just, okay, people forget. What Luke's talking about is when Israel would quickly devalue their currency and then everything's good again, people forget. Right. And each wave of that is going to create more Bitcoiners. And each wave of that is going to kind of harden Bitcoin more and more. And at some point there's, going to, there's, there's this transition. But if you're living in Bitcoin, if you're actually measuring from Bitcoin, the only thing without counterparty risk to that debt, right, everything in the world has counterparty risk to that debt, except for Bitcoin. Hence, choke point 2.0. Exactly. So, but, but if, if you're measuring from Bitcoin, then, then you, then you're seeing prices falling to the marginal cost of production everywhere. And, and that was the point I was trying to make as I think that's what you're doing. And I think that's, I think I get it now. I think it's clicked because units are increasing all the time. Bitcoin, there is a fixed number of units. Totally. And so even when I talked about the luxury car, it would, it's cheaper in Bitcoin terms now bingo. 
than it was Bingo. four years ago. And it'll keep being in four years, it'll be way cheaper in Bitcoin terms. I get it. I see exactly what you're saying. And, and, and the existing system has to try to stop that. And if we think Operation Choke Point is something, if you haven't even seen the half of what's going to come to try to stop that. Now, now remember, the existing system that everybody believes in, if this just clicked for you, imagine how many times we've talked about this, right? Yeah. Imagine how, kind of, that's why when you look at my book, it's going to predict all of this thing, all of these things, and you can see the next steps out of the actions that have to happen from the existing unsustainable system. Even if there's an inflationary period and Bitcoin's value in dollars goes up, but the purchasing power of dollars drops, that's irrelevant because at some point they have to still devalue the currency because you can't end up with $1 trillion notes. Like, But at that point, so many people have moved into Bitcoin anyway it's still trended towards the marginal cost of production. That's so what, either way, they cannot do anything about it. That's 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 exactly it. You're measuring the world differently. You're measuring the you're measuring the world in something that can't be manipulated. You're measuring the, the you're measuring the accurate if prices fall to the marginal cost of production over time, and the marginal cost of production is falling exponentially because of technology and it's everywhere. Then the only way you could measure that is through a fixed monetary unit that couldn't be manipulated. Everything else would be a mismeasurement. But we live in the mismeasurement. We All of our jobs are in the mismeasurement, or not most people. And, and, more, and more and more people are moving into the right measurement. And they're starting to see what, uh, what I'm saying. So proxy wars, are they meant... Are they used as a distraction? Look over here, don't see here. Uh, hence, is this why... China is uh, posturing against Taiwan. Is that for productivity gains? Is that to is that a distraction? Why, why I can't remember why you wrote there'll be proxy wars. Yeah, so so I wrote that in the book, and I wrote it in yeah. in in that uh, in that greatest game article because you could see how do you get elected in that cycle? So so <laughs> so for, first let, first let's take our own individual actions yeah. first, and let. Let's let's say today a, a politician says, "Okay, Jeff's right. Prices fall to the marginal cost of production, right? And this is what we're going to do. We're going to let them fall, right? That means next year, hey voters, you're going to actually make less real, or you're going to make less money, but in real terms, your income is going to go up because prices are going to fall well faster than your wages decline." No one will understand it. They think you're a madman. They think you're a madman. There's no way you would elect that person, right? You, you, so, so, so the point is, you can't change the system from inside the system. No one can. We wouldn't allow it to happen. You have to have something so strong, decentralized, secure, to stop our self-interest from stopping, stopping it. You have to take the, to, uh, take that out of our hands because we want to. We pretend we don't want to vote for somebody who will say it's okay. We're going to give you more money, but we all do too. You'd think that person's a madman. Well, do, do you think Bukele gets it and this is his plan, or do you think it's something? Do you think he doesn't get it and it's more? Do you think he's like a loose Bitcoin, or do you think he fully sees this? I don't. I don't know. Okay. I don't. I don't know. Because I know. if he does, what a genius! Because he's done it. In a very subtle way. He's so, done it without telling them. So he, if you would listen to his stuff far before he was elected, he was a Bitcoiner before he was elected. Yeah. And this gave El Salvador a massive way to get out of the existing system that they were trapped in. And, and all of the crime in El Salvador, all of the other, just like Africa, just like all of these countries, they're trapped in this vortex. It gets worse and worse and worse. They have no way out. He knew about Bitcoin before he was elected. And if you look at some of the interviews, him talking about it. So there's a chance he does know this. Wow. And there's a chance that he is actually building everything towards the, this. Now, even if he wasn't, though, even like if you, that's actually why I try not to get into the personalities, mm. right? Every actor makes Bitcoin stronger. Yeah. Whether whether you hate them or like them, right? If If he's not doing it in the best interest of his population. It actually doesn't matter because his population is winning. Yeah. Right? And and it'll remove and it removes dictator powers over time. It puts it, it gives the power to the people. So 
whether he's doing it for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, it, um, it actually doesn't matter, but, but he could be a genius in, and in, he doesn't in, need to be, he doesn't need to be the second order effects of, of a global reserve currency that has a fixed limit, a true fixed limit, yeah. even better than gold. Uh, it's, 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 it's truly unreal. It's when you think if, if it games out exactly as you say, which has been pretty good so far, it's truly unreal. So, the, so, so why, why could you, why would this be so hard to see? Right. Why? Yeah. Because all of our history books, every single different, when, when we actually say reserve currency, what we actually mean is something to make a debt based system work. Right. Yeah. It carries with it all the baggage of all the other things. Right. And that's why, okay, gold, if I'm the new reserve currency tied to gold, now I can create more monetary units and, 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 and I'm winning as, as an ex, as, and others are losing by that same thing. For a while, it looks like everybody's winning, but because of Triffin dilemma, right? Then, then even if you looked at the US right now, their entire industrial military complex is being outsourced to other nations. And they have no way to bring it back because, because if you brought it back, the cost is too high to bring it back. So, so, to be able to restart their industry, they have to have lower labor rates compared to the world. And the way the world works today, they have higher labor rates and it's all ba based on debt. They're the only purchaser of the world. So if you've got all the BRICS to countries together and there's nobody to buy the stuff and all their, 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 most of their, their drivers are, are raw materials to purchase things to be able to sell to the US and there's no buyer, the whole thing doesn't work. And so if you just, and so why people get caught in that, they're anchored to a system and all the history books, everything else always looked like this system, restarting wars, reset the currency, winner of the war, reset, right, resets the rules, starts again. And, and most of those, and if you'd never seen something that could be decentralized and secure, right, that didn't have to have that then you have a base layer that doesn't need an institution for its kind of reserve, right? You have a, you have a bearer instrument asset in the base, base layer that nobody can change the rules, right? That's a, that's through history. We've never had that. So it would be, it would be an invention or be a discovery that would change forward and all of the other models looking backwards would have some sort of distortion in them. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, if you on layer two added velocity, unlimited velocity to that money, because it acts as a network instead of gold, uh, gold, and you didn't have to replace a debt-based system on top of this because you had unlimited velocity with a bearer instrument in it, then the debt that was needed to be able to drive that those economies isn't needed to be able to drive this the, the future economies. And, and that network growing and growing and growing is what we're talking about. Repricing all of the, all of the existing system is going to be repriced into that network. Did you see all of this before you saw Bitcoin? Had you recognized this? I recognized this before I saw Bitcoin. Bitcoin became, for, for me, and I, it, I think I told you this before, yeah. I was a holder of Bitcoin, but a small holder and almost test trying to see what, what it was. But I actually hadn't done the work to be able to, to defend, could this win against what was coming? Could this remain decentralized secure? When you, when you aggregate all of a, a system that's 10,000 times bigger than Bitcoin, that everyone operates in and tries to make, that makes stronger and stronger, every time they're yelling at that system, every time they're marching on the streets and breaking windows, Every time they go to war to another against another country, they're strengthening that system. They're giving more power to that system. Everything's good for Bitcoin, <laughs> right? Good That's for what Harry Selick said. Yeah. But but they're but they're literally making that system. But again, because think about those wars and think about the broken windows and think about where does the money come to replace it? And and those people will go home after they march on the street, and and then all of a sudden, magically, all of the windows get fixed. Where did the money come from? And it comes from more robbing people. What was the number we saw this morning? 
Which number? The debt. Oh. Deficit. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. Let me pull up the debt clock. But again, even even that. Like but it, it's accelerating. It, it's, it, it has to accelerate. Yeah. So, so, so remember in my book, that I, I said, I even talked about this debt, debt that had grown. You had $185 trillion of new debt in the preceding 20 years mm -hmm. for $46 trillion of global economic growth. So it was essentially a four to one debt for, for growth, right? If you ran your personal finances like that, and it had to grow four to one for every productive I'd dollar, be screwed. you'd kind of be screwed. Yeah. It's the same thing, same thing here. The only, that's, but, and, and it has to, and because technology is driving one way faster and faster and faster, the debt has to, has to grow the manipulation of money now because the debt's already insolvent, has to grow at an offsetting pace. It's just an exponential pattern that is a mirror image of the other exponential pattern. Was it 1.4 trillion for the year so far? Yep. Or oh, that's a, is that total deficit? Budget deficit for the year. So that's going to be way worse. Like I, it, I'll, I'll take the, because what they're doing is in, in the US, they're looking at a lagging indicator of tax receipts from the stimulus, Okay. which is about to collapse. And as jobs collapse too, there's going to be, need to be way more money from government because people are going to say, otherwise they're going to be out on the street. Right. And so as, <clears throat> as those jobs collapse and those people have mortgages and everything else, if that were to happen, instead of having a, a trillion, as they're projecting, I think they're projecting a one and a half trillion dollar deficit this year. It'll be a, it'll be a $4 trillion deficit. Well, I mean, it's 1.4 trillion now, four months in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so yeah, yeah. It, it'll be, and, and, it, and, it, and, and if, if you allowed things to roll over, when I say roll over, if you tightened um, to the point that the debt starts unwinding, it'd be way worse than that. So that if that's a four trillion order, order of magnitude worse, but that's like seventy five percent debt to GDP in a single year. It's, it's like it's nuts. It's the, the, but that's a, it, but it's been nuts for a long time. It's, it's just an exponential pattern. Yeah. And people keep talking about it like it's a surprise. This is why it, a reset is required. It's it, it's no surprise. It has to. It has to right? happen. Like all of this stuff. And is it has to resolve itself one way or the other, and and you you talked about Operation Choke Point. Well, can I come to that? Yeah. Just one because I've got one question I've got before that that leads up to that. You said you were nominally invested in Bitcoin. I assume you're a bit deeper now. We, we don't we won't ask how much, but I assume like me, just uh, irresponsibly long. Um, but are you a gold bug as well? And the reason I ask this is I. I I have cash now that at the moment I follow in the loot conversation. I'm like, well, I don't want to hold this cash, yeah. but I don't want to go all in Bitcoin because of choke point. I have some fears around that, but I don't fear a choke point around gold. So I've been thinking of, uh, but, and, and I say this, I say this for the listeners as well, who yeah. may be questioning the same. I was thinking I should probably have some property. I should probably have some cash. I should probably have some gold and I should probably have a lot of Bitcoin. That, that's probably a, a decent strategy. Am I a gold bug? No. Um, it, do I do I understand the gold bug argument and could it resolve itself in a short term to uh, to gold? Could enough countries agree to a new gold standard or force that through pricing oil and gold like like the BRICS nations are trying to uh, trying to do? Could that happen? And it could be one way to resolve some of this potentially. I see it as unlikely in the long term. Now, it, for me, it's more like the short-term cash savings, which I hold, I'm now thinking of just holding that in gold rather than cash. So so I would suspect that, and, and that's why I say this barbell strategy, you want some cash. I've got some cash. Yeah. You want to keep, and you want to keep some cash because if, if just play the probabilities out, out, I think what's happening today is the backdoor window for the funding mechanism for the US is doing is essentially choosing who they're going to save in Europe and otherwise. Because they don't want China, the China's using that currency as a weapon against the US too. Mm -hmm. And so they're cutting people off from that system and choosing who to save. So the the whole saving um, saving uh, Credit Suisse or brokering that deal, right? And being is is a backdoor funding mechanism. To who to, which which institutions they're going to save, which ones they're going to let let fail. 
Hold on, that makes me think Nord Stream was cut, cutting somebody out of that system. So a lot of these things are, the, the, this, <sighs> the, this game is a geopolitical uh, yeah. ga- game now. This is, this is how to, uh, and, and it has been for a long time. Okay. Can we talk about AI? Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot to take in. Uh, I, I see the world differently from 45 minutes to an hour ago. I get it a lot more. Is that helpful to you? Pardon? Are you going to say, yeah, no, I already got that. Page. No, no, I was <laughs> distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me where it gets everything. Um, okay, let's talk about AI. The, I, I find AI fascinating. Da- Danny every day is showing me new cool stuff. Today he showed me something. Uh, you know how like when a rapper releases a new album, if they have a guest appearance from a famous rapper, that's that can be career making. Yeah. He showed me a thing this morning where a guy's used AI to have Jay-Z uh, as a guest rapper on his video. It's not Jay-Z, it's yeah. just AI doing it. And so every day we're seeing all this cool stuff and maybe it's not really artificial intelligence, it's just super smart program. But either way, it's a new boom that we're starting to see. There's a lot of investment, a lot of interest, a lot of cool things happening. Uh, debates about when we get AGI, like all this is happening. But just generally, this this obviously ha- really relates to your work, your kind of observations of the future. What is your whole, what's your general take on AI first? So general take, and I wrote two chapters on AI, the general purpose technology that is going to be smarter than us. And people get scared of it or excited by it, by, by, by it's going to take all jobs tomorrow or it's going to make me more efficient. In both of those, it's eventually going to take all jobs. And because marginal cost of production falls to zero, it's going to yep. be better at things. Then it's going to merge with robots. And not just the robot humanoids that you think it would look like, every version of types of robots that could do different things that we could imagine today. That could and then grow, it will kill us. It, um, but it, but it, no, it's part of it. It's, and, and I see us actually being, <laughs> should we go here or not? Yes, let's let's definitely, go go here. Here. <laughs> definitely go here. We've been having some pretty existential chats about this. Okay, so so let's, let's just play forward because that's what I talked about in the book, right? I talked about all human intelligence is, is error correction. Okay. Human intelligence is error correction. And we stand on the shoulders of other people who have gone before us and those models. We're constantly trying to correct and make better in service of humanity, right? In service of our own needs, making life better. And when we create things that are better uh, for other people, we win more of the economic pie. That's what the world looks like, right? It's always looked like that. We, and we forget all of the things we're living on top of, um, and all of the, so we we don't have to, we don't have to think about relativity today. Yeah, we're we're a couple hundred years ago. People had to kind of figure out all of these things. We don't have to figure out Maxwell's equations or Faraday lines that led to Maxwell's equations to drive our tele, uh, telecommunication systems. So we just all rely on. We don't think of those things because they're now models that are so proven, and our world just works right? They weren't always proven. And we used to have to think really hard and life didn't look like it looks like today because people couldn't figure that out. And those insights then moved to these models and we are cracked on top of those models. Fair? Mm-hmm. That's all we totally. do. Yeah. Right? Um, and so human intelligence is literally error correction and a global kind of uh, 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 driving that. And, and what that effectively what that means is or a different way to look at that is all we are on an evolutionary scale is one rung in, in, in a ladder searching for, we're limited energy. We ourselves are limited energy, limited storage and limited compute. And, and we're connected through trust and division of labor to do certain things, micro things better than others. And we trade our time for somebody else's time that does the, that other thing better, right? Mm-hmm. That's what the glow. That's what, and and so we create a supercomputer of us. All of those limited energy, limited <laughs> storage, and limited brains brains compute. We create a supercomputer, unlimited. It's, what's it? almost an unlimited supercomputer that we does, we actually project. We think about what the world could look like, and, and we're constantly doing that all together to try to make that, that world better. And it's connected through trust and money. And, and then what ends up happening in that is, it, for a long time, 
the bigger the cities, the bigger the supercompute, mm -hmm. right? So more people race to the cities. And you could see a power law in a smaller a town had had less supercompute, and a, a tiny town had very little compute, so not much happened there, right? And you could see that create that power uh, that power law. And if you run a counterfactual to that, right? What about where broken money in a big city? What does it look like in Mexico City? Do you have that same type of innovation coming out of that, or do people not trust each other as much, right? And what you can see is. Is or take a take a different city that has kind of had currency failure, and there's not a trust. You break the bonds of the supercomputer, right? So you can see that 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 now when when I say that limited energy, limited storage, and limited compute, now take giant waves of prosperity for humanity, or 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 phase transitions for humanity. Phase transitions came when one of those three, or two of those three changed. Printing press was a massive change in storage, right? So we're searching for more storage because we have limited. And before that, we had to tell stories. And those stories lost fidelity over time. And now our stories could be put into books, all, all our thoughts and it could run, it, run into storage. And when there's more storage and more brains connected to that storage, you have more compute. And, and you have this massive innovation that happens as, as a result of it. Look at the UK, UK against that same, the same thing or, uh, or the British empire was created by a higher form of energy, coal against that storage and compute. The U S was a higher form of energy than in the coal in oil against that storage. And that, that function has essentially made us and driven limited storage, limited uh, uh, compute, uh, limited, sorry, limited energy, limited storage, limited compute. That is who we are on an ever ending journey to find more energy, more storage, more compute. And when we find more energy, more storage, more compute, society I I expands. So that what's happening right now is that that storage is now moving into a computer which is far more effective than an analog version of a book. And it's now computing on its own and it's learning on its own. And now you have auto GPT that is actually just referencing other layers of information and creating more learning and getting faster and faster and faster. That's, that's overtaking our ability. And eventually what's going to, and we're going to search for, we're going to constantly searching for more energy, right? In to be able to feed that which we'll do, right? All in service. Eventually what it'll look like is not the AI against us. I, I don't suspect. We, this is. <laughs> we hope. It, it'll look like, um, it'll look like we will merge with machines. It's the next evolution. The, the next evolution is when is you. Is that the Musk, you know, Musk scenario? Uh, Neuralink. So I, whether it's, so, so it, from the existing system, that, it, that AI will be used against you. You will be a slave in the system because mm -hmm. it'll be consolidated um, up to up to whether it's government, whether it's a, and, uh, whether it's Elon Musk, whether it, in fact anybody who is not in favor of prices falling to the marginal cost of production, kind of driving Bitcoin. Anybody who's in favor of of essentially stopping prices from falling is essentially saying, "I'm voting." to centralize all power in somebody's hands. Right. Right. Okay. That's what they're, that's what they're doing uh, unintentionally, maybe, but they're voting to essentially, essentially, I'd believe that we should steal money at an increasing rate to be able to transfer it to somebody's hands. It, it, even if you just said, um, it, like, think about the system, you have financial regulation to protect you from a system designed to steal your money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 how, how how could that go wrong? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I mean, the thing I can't picture, Jeff, though, is what this all looks like. That's that's the difficulty in a world where AI does start replacing a lot of jobs, like significantly and at an accelerated rate. But even if we had a fall in the marginal cost of production, 
what how does society function how how do people what do people do with their time how do they have enough so i think i, I think in in 1920, it was 1923 that Keynes wrote Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. Whenever that was, maybe Danny, take a, take a look at what date that was written. He's going to ask Chat GB. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but in writing um, uh, that, he predicted, and this is where he got this thing totally wrong. He predicted the trend properly about te where technology was going. But he didn't predict what human nature would do to money. So he predicted the global average working week would be 10 hours a week in, in 2020. What's happened? And so what would happen if you let prices fall? People would have more than they have today um, without the time and the jobs. It's just such a paradigm shift. It's hard, so hard to believe because, because you can't prove that. Right. You have to infer it from what the what the trend would do because we haven't lived in that world. But how what, what does the world look like? Some people, because they're sitting on top of rent seeking from that, they're not productive. It's not being productive form of value for other people. They're sitting on top of that system that they're getting uh, wealth gain at the expense of other people in the world. So some people are working. 80 hours, 100 hours, trying to keep up, and they're getting it's getting harder and harder and harder. Used to be, if you were in the one percent, it was really great. Now you need to be in the point one percent to be really great because you'll need to work less to gain more. Exactly, it's a complete flip. It, it's the in that paradigm flip is so hard to fathom because we don't live in it. No, right? We're in, but if you follow the rules of economic value, if follow the rules laid out, how would that look? Because it works exactly the opposite. If you just said wages are sticky, right? So people think, oh, it's just a transfer of wealth to these new people and it's going to look exactly the same. No, it isn't. Wages are sticky. So what that means is if wages are sticky and that's why inflation works going the other way, then wages are sticky. People don't, won't give a price, uh, a wage decrease as fast as prices are falling. So to be a It'll be a massive, tra massive transfer of wealth back to productive members of society. And as jobs are lost, the, the people that are, are going to be able to live on less and less and less forever, right? Why don't you pay for the oxygen you're breathing right now? It's ludicrous, right? Well, it would be ludicrous to have somebody walk in here and say, oh, here's your oxygen mask. Um, but it's not ludicrous. Nestle in, would try. It's, but it's not ludicrous. It's not ludicrous um, in space, and it's not ludicrous underwater, where the marginal cost of production is higher hmm. for oxygen, right? But it's ludicrous. But we can't see that that is exactly the same thing that we're artificially creating that scarcity in everything else, where where the natural way, natural order of things would drive more and more things to abundance. Amazing. Jeff, I think we're going to save, save the rest for this evening awesome. when we do our event. Um, but thank you. That's really clicked today in a way it hasn't before. Um, thank you. Thank you. Oh, appreciate you. you, man.